today. So today we have a great presentation by Pat and Steve. Um, I'm going to start off with just a little bit of introductory material just to get some context about the rattlesnake and wilderness areas in general. So it's hard to not uh, talk about the wilderness without the Wilderness Act, which was passed in 1964. And this is meant to be a protective overlay um, to protect land that's already uh, owned by the federal government. So this includes national forests, parks, wildlife refugee, refuges, except, et cetera. Since enactment, every president has created some or designated some area of wilderness, and that is equated to around 112 million acres or approximately the size of California that has been protected with wilderness uh, since 1964. So the general process is that usually a state or a federal agency, government, organized groups, individuals will uh, push for designation of a wilderness area that's then picked up by someone in Congress or in the Senate to push that designation through the legislature. And then it's signed by the president and then it'll be officially designated. Um, in terms of management of these wilderness areas, there are a few quotes that might come up in their discussion today. One is untrammeled by man. So this is just the idea that wilderness should be should not be managed by humans or it shouldn't be encroached or urbanized. Um, and then also this idea of there shouldn't be travel with uh, mechanical advantage. So this is usually um, anything with a gear. So bikes, cars, that kind of stuff shouldn't be uh, entering into to wilderness areas. A final note is that uh, very few wilderness areas exist near large urban areas. So I did a very, very informal survey and found that like Salt Lake City, Tucson, and Jackson, Wyoming, these areas have some uh, wilderness that's really close by, but Missoula is really special in that most it's really close to an urban area, and that's not true of many other larger urban areas. So now thinking about the, the rattlesnake wilderness specifically, so it is a part of the territorial homeland of the Salish people. Um, and if you were here for Sally or Mirna's talk that we uh, sponsored about a month ago, uh, we learned a lot about that early history of when the Salish and the European colonizers were coming in. Um, but since the uh, European colonization, the area in the Rattlesnake Wilderness has been used for many different purposes. Lots of res residential areas, especially in the lower Rattlesnake, mines, schools. Um, they'll talk a lot about motorbikes and the importance of that in this story. Um, and then all kinds of other stuff. Um, it's also important to, to know that most of the upper watershed was owned by the Montana Power Company, later the Mountain Power Company, to augment Missoula's water supply. So the Rattlesnake Wilderness was designated in 1980. That included 34,000 acres of wilderness, but also an adjacent 28,000 acres uh, in a national recreation area, and they'll talk a little bit about that split. Um, and then finally, uh, the Montana Power Company had to transfer around a third of that area to the federal government soon after the wilderness designation. And it's currently managed by the Lolo National Forest. So now I just want to make sure we're all on the same page spatially about what exactly um, we're talking about when we say the rattlesnake wilderness. So we're down here in Missoula, the library. This is the trailhead of the National Recreation Area, which is probably what most of us are familiar with when we think about the wilderness area, and then the wilderness areas actually appear in red. It's a little hard to see, but it's much further up um, than the actual trails where we actually start start much of our recreation. If we zoom in a little bit more, we can look at what's delineating this, the wilderness area. So here is Rattlesnake Creek. We have Stewart Peak on the south, southern edge. Snowballs over here on the east side. So you're actually really close to the wilderness area if you're skiing over here. We have the tribal primitive area, which is kind of the northern boundary with McLeod Peak. And then on the east side, we have the National Recreation Area and Lolo National Forest. And then a unique thing about the Rattlesnake Watershed or the Wilderness Area is that Rattlesnake Creek, there's a third of a mile buffer centered on Rattlesnake Creek that is actually National Recreation Area. So that's not an official wilderness area. And that's uh, something that Steve and Pat will be discussing, I imagine. Okay, with that, I will introduce our two speakers. So Steve Woodruff was the Missoula's environment and natural resource reporter in the early 1980s when issues involving the rattlesnake wilderness were in the newspaper on almost a daily basis. He and his two colleagues ultimately wrote a book titled Montana Wilderness Dis Discovering the Heritage, which was published in 1984. And it included a chapter on the rattlesnake wilderness um, that focused on the question of what is wilderness. 
Steve later served for 20 years as the Missoulin's opinion page editor before stepping off in 2007. Since then, he's worked with a variety of nonprofits and conservation groups and taught journalism at the University of Montana. He's made many trips to the Rattlesnake Wilderness on foot, horseback, snowshoes, and skis. And then Pat Williams. Um, Pat represented Butte in Silverbow County in the Montana House from 1967 to 1969. He then was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1979, where he stewarded the le legislation describing the Rattlesnake Wilderness in his first few years as a freshman congressman. Pat went on to serve nine terms as a U.S. congressman through 1996. And after retiring from Congress, Pat joined the O'Connor Center for the Rocky Mountain West at UM, where he was a senior fellow in regional policy and a general educator. During this time, he taught, wrote a regular newspaper column carried by many newspapers in the Rocky Mountain West and hosted a region-wide humanities program on public radio. Pat currently lives in the Rattlesnake Watershed with his wife, Carol. So with that, I'll let Pat and Steve come up to the table here. Well, perhaps uh, as we get started here, uh, uh, let's take a moment to think about this incredible library we're sitting in. I mean, uh, named the world's best new library last year. That's something I'm immensely proud of. I had nothing to do with it other than paying my property taxes. But we have this incredible library we're sitting on. We're surrounded here on three sides with open space that we bought paid for, we manage, we, we, we steward. Um, we're along the banks of the Clark Fork River, once one of the, the, uh, the country's worst environmental disasters. Uh, we cleaned that river up. We removed the dam and the environmental nightmare that was behind it. We stored the confluence of the Blackfoot and Clark Fork Rivers. We beautified the river bank. We've created this credible trail system. We could go on and on. And I, I, pull, I, 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 I mention all that because I think it helps define who we are in Missoula, what this community is about and who we are. We're people who do big things to make this a better place. And I'm, I guess I'm going to uh, suggest that the first big thing that we as Missoulians did to make this a better place was to protect the rattlesnake. So with that as a preface, um, let's talk about how this all happened, what, what it took to create a, uh, a federally designated wilderness area on the outskirts of our fine city. And, uh, Pat Williams was our congressman at the time. He, uh, I, I guess I would assert that uh, uh, not only did he play a central role in this endeavor, that, um, but also it might not have happened if not for Pat. So many people were involved, and we'll talk about that, but Pat played a, a central role. And as I turn to you, Pat, I want to ask you, you grew up in, Bur in Butte, the uh, the Western world's Careful. capital, <laughs> a capital of uh, resource extraction, uh, where wilderness was not really something you were you were focused on. How did you come to be a champion of wilderness? Thanks, Steve. Steve and I are old pals who get together quite often over coffee which is very difficult for a Butte guy to do, very difficult. Shows you how much I like him. So we're not strangers, uh, but neither have, we, uh, neither have we done very much planning on our presentations here. Steve has uh, agreed to ask me a few questions and uh, keep things moving. So I thank you for doing this, Steve, and uh, I particularly want to thank the sponsors and promoters of uh, getting you all together, but uh, as with any presentation or any speaker, 
I thank you for being here. Can you imagine doing this if there were just chairs? So it's very important to have people in front of you when you uh, when you do this sort of thing. Uh, so I think the question is, why would a Butte guy give a damn about wilderness or even recognize it if he stumbled into it? Uh, And I guess the answer is, well, that's why. If you grow up with living across the street from a mine, and I have a lot of friends in Butte, they were all born on the wrong side of the tracks, and they all lived across the street from a mine. It's the way it certainly was over there, and I assume for many people who live there, it still is. If you grow up that way, And then you uh, come to the University of Montana as a kid. And uh, you begin to take classes here on the way you hope to a degree. You make sure you get back to Butte every Saturday night, but you're in Missoula, you're going to school. And somebody says, let's take a walk up into the rattlesnake. And if you're me at that time, you say, what? A walk into the rattlesnake. Come on. Where the hell do we live here? What's the rattlesnake? Oh, it's just the name of this area up here. It's the name of the creek. Creek runs through this big area, which you know. You've been into it. You've just seen on the map. And you go up there. You go into any area like it. Changes your life changes your life and you don't have to just be from butte for it thank you for putting the brakes on us here <laughs> if you've come to a pushy guy's uh savior here um changes your life now i'd i'd been on the big hole and i fished a lot as a kid and i was in nice areas but i never got in a car and within a few minutes, was in a parking lot and then walked into an area like the rattlesnake. I'd never been around it. And uh, I didn't think to myself, you know, this should have national protection. It should, all this land should belong to the people. There's got to be trades made because individuals and groups own big parts of this land and has to be a lot of work done to consolidate it all. And then we have to uh, put it in something called wilderness. None of that entered my mind as I was a freshman walking up Rattlesnake Creek with a couple of friends who also lived, uh, unlike me, lived in Missoula. So why would a guy from Butte later decide that this area deserved the highest protection that the federal government can offer. Because I was from Butte. I love Butte. And there's wonderful land surrounding Butte. But where I lived in Butte, where all my friends lived and still live in Butte, was very different than walking up Rattlesnake Creek. So that's why a Butte guy might say later in life, wow, I've been elected to a position where early in my career, among the very first things I can do as Montana's congressman is to see what can be done to protect that area I walked in all those years ago. And I think it's what you would do too if the same set of circumstances had hit you. Well, Pat, let's talk about those circumstances. What was going on? What pre uh, you eventually ran for Congress and were elected in 1978. Uh, can you tell us about running for office and 
the issues you were dealing with and whether the rattlesnake was on the radar and uh, and then how did how did, did you first uh, become aware of the idea of of designating a wilderness here and uh, who brought that to you? Well, of course, I spent a lot of time campaigning in in uh, Missoula because I'd been a student here. I was familiar with the town. I've lived here now for 20 some years. I lived in Helena between going to school here and then later moving here. I lived in Butte, of course. And then Carol and I and our kids uh, were a family in Helena. And then uh, uh, got elected to Congress, spent a lot of time here and I do not remember, I'm probably, it's just that my memory is not what it was when I was a freshman at the University of Montana. Although my teachers at the time would have said, no, he couldn't remember anything then either. <laughs> um, but I don't recall anyone during my campaign coming to me and saying, Pat, if you get elected, there's an area up here called the rattlesnake, which I would have known about because I walked on the, along the creek when I was a kid going to school. Uh, there's an area up here, and now that you're our congressman, or when you get to be our congressman, you should think about putting that. I don't remember anybody saying that to me. What I recall is that a... Uh, a great guy named Henry Bugby. You may know Bruce. And uh, uh, a friend of his, whose name is slipping away, uh, Arnie Boley, great friend of Henry's and a lot of other people around here, said to me one day, Pat, we're going to get a small group of people together. I was still a candidate at the time. Get a small group of people. Uh, no, I'd been elected, but only for, I'd, I'd been your congressman for a few weeks. And Arnie said, we're going to get a few people together at my house up in the Rattlesnake. Uh, we like to talk to you about an issue. Will you come by? Of course. And so I went by and Henry and Arnie, and I think they had somebody from the Forest Service there, and then two or three other people who had formed a group called Friends of the Rattlesnake, which some of you remember. Um, gave me a little presentation about this area. And the thing that stood out for me was, I think it was Henry saying, uh, we want to take you up there, Pat, a couple of different times because it's a big area. Well, we want to take you up there when you're back on one of your weekends or whatnot from D.C. and you have time. I said, all right. And then their conversation went to what I would see when I went up there. And they weren't flowery about it. They weren't, oh, it's, it's visions you only dream of marvelous views down at lakes and towering peaks and snow clad it wasn't any of that they said to me pat this area's been beat to hell there's fences still in it there's dams that we hope to get rid of that need to be taken out of there uh fire's eating some of it up but what fire hasn't eaten up the timber industry has it's been terribly logged, and a bunch of it's eroded. And I'm pulling up in my mind the definition of wilderness. You know, what the hell? That doesn't sound like wilderness to me. <laughs> when I went up there, it was really pretty, and I liked it. But what they're describing is not wilderness. Uh, that was their pitch. Odd. I said, sure. 
I know about areas like that. I'm from Butte. Although this ended up being a hell of a lot more marvelous looking than some of that land in downtown, <laughs> downtown Butte. Yeah, I, I wonder if uh, the, I mean, the people who approached you maybe were exaggerating some of the of the environmental degradation up there simply to press the urgency. I, I remember, you know, back the, in, and many of us will remember, back in the, the 60s and 70s, uh, the time of, of uh, much greater timber harvest than what we see here today, there was pressure on the Forest Service to produce ever greater volumes of timber. Uh, people were concerned about that. Uh, there were these uh, 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 tote goats, you remember these tote goats, little motorcycles that could go anywhere? Those were, were coming onto the scene and uh, motorbikes, people were concerned about motorized use into places uh, like the rattlesnake. And, um, you know, we had, I don't know how many sawmills and uh, other wood product mills we had right here in Missoula, in Bonner, the largest plywood plant in North America was just up the, up the river. Um, every town in Montana almost had a, or Western Montana had a sawmill. These were, you know, these were important jobs. So they, it was all that tension, but it was also the, you know, many of us in the early 70s got our first backpacks. Backpacking became a real thing. Out, um, uh, outdoor recreation was, was kind of, it was in its, uh, Early days, it's early modern days, but we were get, we were starting to appreciate some of these places in new ways. So I think there was probably some tension out there that was creating a sense of urgency um, about what uh, what we could do to protect uh, up there. But there had been logging up the Rattlesnake, a Montana Power Company which owned twenty thousand acres up the uh, in the watershed because it ran. The water utility, it owned the water utility for Missoula. In 1979, it sold that to, Mont, uh, to Mountain Water. But, um, but through the 70s, when people were worrying about that, what, what was going to happen with the rattlesnake, the um, Montana Power Company owned a s significant chunk of that to provide water for this community. We got a lot of our water from that creek. Um, so I think all that, but the, the point is, though, that the Wilderness Act, uh, says that, uh, I'll read here, uh, that uh, definition of wilderness is a place where man and his works dominate, uh, do not dominate. The, uh, uh, not wilderness is man dominates, but in wilderness, there are areas untrammeled by man. And it, it's an interesting word, untrammeled. It's not a word most of us use very often. It's subject to a lot of interpretation and what that means. And but you have the rattlesnake where there's a 13-mile road going right up the middle of it. There are dams on many of the lakes. There had been some small clear-cut uh, logging. At one point, there were 19 homesteads in the lower rattlesnake. In the, uh, in the rattlesnake, that's the lower rattlesnake, we call it, but in the lower part of this area. There were definitely there have been motorized incursions into these places. So... I don't know what the definition of trammeled is exactly, um, but uh, it was debatable. And I guess uh, amid that backdrop, uh, maybe you could talk, Pat, about some of the, uh, the complications here of um, your approach to uh, help designate a wilderness area for the rattlesnake, but there are these kind of counterfactual things where it, it might, it was, arguable whether it really fit. Well, I always kidded my friend Arnie Boley years later uh, about this issue and his support for the rattlesnake, which, by the way, was true. His support was real. And uh, there was great reason for his and the others supporting, trying to designate, have the Congress designate the rattlesnake as wilderness. Uh, but I used to kid him. I'd say, 
Ernie, <laughs> you wanted me to go see the rattlesnake and look at the dams and look at some of the old clear cuts and look at how there hasn't been much done, frankly, by the Forest Service to repair any of that. Because you don't think I'll notice anything up there. Because you know I'm from Butte, and it'll look good to me. <laughs> Arnie was, Pat, if people in Butte knew you were saying that about them. <laughs> I got it. Um, yeah. I forget that poem. There's a poem, something about it. No. And the line of the poem ends, but it looks pretty good to me. And uh, it did then, and it does today, of course. A rattlesnake looks pretty good to anybody that goes up and takes a look at it. I tried to find out, but I was talking to the wrong people. I tried to find out how many visitors they'll have up there uh, this winter, this summer, spring and summer, fall. It's an extraordinary number of people uh, who get into the lower area and approach, and many uh, get into the upper area, which is the wilderness area. The lower area is, uh, uh, has less protection than uh, less definition of protection than does the upper area. Uh, But it's a it's an extraordinary place of solitude and getaway for Missoula's visitors, backpackers, and those of us who live in Missoula, as Carol and I now have for I don't know twenty two, twenty three years. Uh, The uh, it seems to me that the name is right for it. When I was wondering, should I really adopt this and try to uh, give the apply wilderness designation to this area? Uh, I was a freshman in Congress; I'd just been elected, and. Uh, Along come Bowley and the others, and they have me in their living room. They're talking to me about what can we do to protect this area, and obviously it was going to be wilderness. And uh, I can remember thinking, I wonder who named this area, <laughs> the rattlesnake. I did a little looking at that, trying to figure it out. Went into the uh, old library here and over at the university, and when I'd travel over here and meet with people about about it, uh, it turns out that apparently the people that named it named it after the creek. Named the creek first. This winding snake of a body of water. Um, but in any event, uh, it is one of the closest uh, areas now that it's been designated and it's there and we love it. It's one of the closest areas to a genuinely urban area, one of the closest natural areas to a January, genuine neighborhood. Uh, in the United States, so we have a we have a fondness that, in part, is about our relationship to it in terms of being the rattlesnake's neighbor. You know, I I I, I think there was such a, um, and much of this predates me, but uh, in my arrival on the scene, but I did uh, have a lot of opportunity to talk to people about the 
early days of, uh, of advocacy toward protection for the rattlesnake. But there was such concern about motorized vehicles up there um, that uh, I think there was a gravitation toward the Wilderness Act because it was the only, I, I think, uh, the, the only mechanism at the time that would cert for certain ban motorized vehicles. And uh, do, you, uh, do, do you recall that being uh, um, a significant issue? Well, the issue was what to do with the road that runs up the middle of it. And the delegation, the congressional delegation, which was Senator John Melcher, who was from Forsyth. He was a veterinarian. And by the way, one of his uh, congressional biographies, the people that write the little paragraph about you for congressional directories, one of the uh, one of the paragraphs that was written about John said that he was uh, the Senate's only vegetarian. I thought John was going to have a stroke. <laughs> Not a goddamn vegetarian. Um, <laughs> but. John and I and Max and my colleague and friend in the house, a fellow from eastern Montana, Ron Marlinay. Those of you who are natives remember Ron. Ron and I were uh, on different sides of the aisle and didn't agree on much politically, but uh, both for our enjoyment as well as Montana's sake, we were good friends. And uh, Ron wanted zero to do with this process of this area in Missoula. Zero. He didn't want anything to do with it. Didn't support wilderness. We were both on the relevant committee called the Interior Committee in the House. So we were both going to have a hand in it. And Ron said to me early on, look, Pat, you have to understand something. I'm not going to vote for this. I'm going to speak against it. I'm going to try to round up my friend Republicans' votes against it on the floor, but I'm not going to throw myself across the tracks about it. Democrats had a majority in the House in those days where Ron and I were members, and uh, then it was going to the Senate where Melcher and Baucus were members, and uh, Marg and I said, other than letting people know I'm against doing this, uh, I'm not going to interfere with it. Uh, so uh, uh, in, in my first term, my first year, uh, my pal Boley, Arnold Boley, came to me during a trip to Missoula weekend trip and from the Congress, you know, home to visit, uh, came to me and he said, uh, sometime in the next few months, Pat, I'd like you to come to my house. I want to talk to you about protecting uh, this area that is just outside of town here, a few miles outside of town. And I'll get some friends, including, he said, your friend Henry Bugby. And uh, we'll sit in my living room and have coffee or me and your butte guy, something stronger if you want. And we'll sit around, drink, and talk about what the Congress might be willing to do and you might be willing to lead on with regard to trying to protect that land up there. He asked me if I knew the place. I said, a little bit. I went up there three or four times when I was a student here at the university, the first time was uh, very early on. A couple of friends of mine who were students from Missoula wanted to take me up there. I can't tell you what lake we went to. I just can't remember. I, I didn't know where I was. We just seemed to me like we walked forever from our dorm up to, <laughs> up to the rattlesnake and then up a mountain and looked down on this lake. 
Oh, my God, that's one of the prettiest things I've ever seen in my life. Stunning. But I couldn't find it now with a map. But uh, one of the lakes up there, gorgeous. And so I remembered the area. And uh, Bugby and, and Ernie Boley and four or five other people and I sat in Boley's living room. And uh, I listened to them tell me what the chore ahead would be and would I be willing to take on trying to designate this area as a national wilderness area. I don't think I gave them any commitment at that time, but I did uh, both on my way back to Washington and while I was there recall my trips up there when I was a student here. And uh, I had also been elected to the interior, uh, been uh, supported for membership on the House Interior Committee. And the Interior Committee was then, it's been named now Natural Resources Committee, but same general jurisdiction. It is starting point for deciding whether or not the Congress of the United States is going to pass a law to designate an area wilderness. It has to be federal land. And by the way, the Montana Power Company held uh, a very significant portion of the rattlesnake in their own ownership. They own 20% of it or so. And uh, so, you know, what are we going to do about all that? And you think we could consolidate these lands and turn it into wilderness? Uh, they told me about some group called the Friends of the Rattlesnake. And uh, I thought to myself, I wonder if anybody wants to join that group because they would be known as the friend, a friend of the rattlesnake by people outside Missoula, that has a connotation you may not want to be part of. Well, let's stop and kind of hold on to this meeting that you had with Arnie Boley and company. Arnie Boley was the former dean of the forestry school here and was uh, an officer of the, uh, the National Wilderness Society, the very highly respected, uh, influential guy in the wilderness politics in America. Uh, we're lucky to have him here. But so you have this meeting with a handful of people. I mean, contrary to what a lot of people think about how government works, it isn't a congressman having a bright idea and then introducing a bill on his own. It's not a small cadre of people coming to a congressman to do that. There was a lot that preceded that meeting. Uh, in fact, for 10 years almost, uh, from the early 70s all the way up to your election as a congressman, people in Missoula had been uh, had been uh, advocating, getting uh, signatures on petitions, writing letters to the editor. There were newspaper stories, editorials. There were meetings, meeting meetings to to advance this idea of a rattlesnake wilderness. So maybe talk a little bit about how a bill actually comes to you as a congressman. Um, you remember uh, in your sixth grade political science class or government class, uh, the little guy, the stick figure, the little cartoon that was imprinted on the pages of your book, textbook, and he had a little rolled up piece of paper under his arm, and the title of that chapter was How a Bill Becomes a Law. And this little guy walked you through a process, committee, subcommittees, committees, House, Senate, conference committee, down to the president, maybe you get a signature on his piece of paper, rolled up paper. That's how a bill became a law. Uh, I taught that. I taught sixth graders about that. And uh, now here I am a few years later, and I'm a congressman. And I can tell you that that little stick figure doesn't exist. That's not how it happens. There's an alchemy in it. There's magic in it. 
There's unseen circumstances. There's history you didn't even know about. I didn't even know about. It's a potion made up in part of people's wishes, their dreams, their opposition, their support. It's a great alchemy. The guy who drew that stick figure did a smart thing. He said, look, people aren't going to spend a lot of time with this. We'll just tell them there's a little stick figure that goes around to these committees. and That's how Bill becomes a law. Of course, we don't quite believe that when we see the stick figure of this little guy, I know. But when you run up against it head on in the Congress of the United States, you realize that the influence is necessary to make a bill become a law. Take this wonderful area, four miles outside of a place called Missoula, Montana, and turn it into an area that is to be protected forever in this same condition. That's American magic. We lived through it. And now we live with its product, the Rattlesnake Wilderness and National Recreation Area. Um, it took the media, which has become a very important part of America's information and understanding. It takes the media. It takes our ability to read. So it's about schools and education and all those things that let us understand what it is we can do as a people to create an area called the Rattlesnake Wilderness. I use the word create. I should use the word designate. The wind and rain and nature and God and all the rest created it. Um, it's a wonderful magic thing, which reminds me to stop and thank you for electing me to that place so I could try and do some of these things. And over 18 years, nine terms, I was never again to witness the clear vision of the alchemy magic that makes a bill a law that designates an area as wilderness, that creates schools, that builds highways. I was never again witness as clear a making of all of that as I was during my first term as a member of Congress, two-year terms, in the creation of the Rattlesnake, where I lived through all of that influence, all of those dreams come true for the people living in this city. It's uh, a wonderful American experience. So, not quite as simple as we thought. Um, the, but So we had this decade of advocacy and uh, community action that culminated in this meeting with you and an agreement to, to uh, carry a bill. Um, so, uh, everybody setting in for the long slog to get this bill through Congress but what actually happened, you got this bill th um, through, through Congress in about a year. How did that happen? How did that happen so fast? And as part of that, how did, how did this question of, of what is wilderness and, and could this even qualify as wilderness, uh, how did you get through all that? Well, it did take all those kind of things I'm talking about, I guess. 
uh, I didn't keep a, a diary on it. I'm now trying to write a chapter or two in a book I'm writing, I'm trying to write about it. But my problem was I didn't keep notes at the time. <laughs> didn't keep notes at the time. And I can't tell you everything that went into it because for a lot of it, I wasn't there. I don't know how Arnie Boley became an environmentalist and Henry Bugby. The other people in the room that day in Arnie's house, I don't know what prompted them to have the kind of energy they had to create the Friends of the Rattlesnake and then talk to people like me and Senator Melcher and Senator Baucus trying to get this thing started. Um, what I do know uh, is that uh, the party I belong to, you know, my own preference, had the majority in the House. It was a fairly significant majority in those days. Democratic Party had been elected by the people of Montana and America to a majority in the Congress. And the chairman of a committee of which I was a member was a gentleman from Arizona named Morris Udall. You may remember the name Mo Udall. Mo ran for president. And uh, Mo used to say, I guess I'm an environmentalist. And he didn't mean he was lukewarm about it. He just didn't quite know what it meant. He was kind of caught up in this alchemy thing I'm talking to you about, this magic thing that happens. So he used to say, yeah, I guess I'm an environmentalist. Fate, I don't know. He lived in Arizona. And by the way, when people would say to Mo, as some of the national environmentalists frankly did, they'd go to Mo during this process of trying to get the bill through subcommittee and his full committee and a fairly long, arduous process, although it seems to me now, as Steve was indicating, it happened in a flash. And I put the bill in one year, and the end of the next year, we were passing it. It was getting the president's signature. So that happened in a literally a flash. Um Udall lived in the kind of country where he was able to respond to some people from the National Environmental Movement who said to him, Mr. Chairman, this young fellow from Montana, Pat Williams, has introduced a bill that's in your committee. And apparently it's, you've put it in a subcommittee where it's going to be accepted and it'll go to your full committee. And you know, we certainly want more and more wilderness, but we do want you to know, sir, that the area is scarred up. It's gone through tough times. Like a lot of Montana land, it's been battered. Now, to me, being from Butte, it looked very pristine. It had glowed like a diamond. And uh, Mo said to them, according to one of them who came to see me later, he said, uh, look, uh, our information is that Montana may be changing. Montana sent Mike Mansfield, sent Arnold Olson. They sent our greatest hero, Lee Metcalf. But we think it may be changing. However, this guy might be a, for this, however long he can stay here, he might be a, a respite. Uh, here he is from Butte. And Mo said to me, this environmentalist said to me, Mo said, you know, Pat Williams is from Butte. And he said he, he was sitting behind his desk and we were all in his room. He said there were about 10 or 15 of us there to express some concerns about this area because it didn't quite have wilderness quality. They were perfectly willing it to be wilderness, but they just wanted Mo to know it didn't have quite the qualities. And uh, this environmentalist said to me, Mo said to uh, 
Have you all been to this district I represent in Arizona? You ever walked out into that desert? It's all beat to hell. You're always after me to put it in wilderness. You want that to be designated? What's wrong with this area in Montana? Plus, this kid needs a win back here, and he needs it fast. Montanans have to know that this guy's on this side of these kind of land use issues. And uh, let's give him a win here. So the politics of it were very important to you, Dahl. And it was that beyond anything else, including me and whatever limited abilities I had as a brand new congressman. I had been a legislator in the Montana legislature for a couple of terms, but you know, my passing bills was an unknown in the uh, in the Congress. So most I do them. Let's let's give this a chance. Let's see what happens. Let's help this young guy. Well, and you, uh, I guess you got it done in part by creating two designations. One was the wilderness area, which is the wilder, untrammeled country in, uh, uh, higher and farther back. And then the National Recreation Area, uh, which was uh, an, an interesting thing. And I, I, I don't know, I, I guess this, uh, before we move on, I just would point out that I would guess that 95% of the use of what we call the rattlesnake is in the National Recreation Area. The wilderness is actually extremely difficult to get to. You either have to go up to get, say you're standing in the wilderness, you have to go up the creek all the way up to the end of that road. And whether you take a bike or your feet or uh, skis, and I've done all of those, I also rode my horse up there. It's a long, hard um, way up there. Um, um, or you have to go up over Stewart Peak, and there are other harder ways to go in there. But it's hard to – it's a well-bunkered wilderness. And I, I, my perception is very little use back. The front country, though, the, the National Recreation Area is uh, – boy, that's, uh, that gets tremendous use. And so well done on, on figuring that nut out. Um, as part of all this, you had to figure out what to do with Montana power companies. You can't just – take their land, uh, you've designated a wilderness area around their land, including their land. You had to make a, some sort of a deal. You had to reach out and talk to Joe McElwain, the, uh, the head of Montana Power at the time. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your engagement with the power company. I'd had some association with the power company because their headquarters was and remains in Butte. And having been a former state legislator from Butte and having taught there for almost 10 years, I knew a lot of people, including the uh, head and chairman of the board of the Montana Power Company, Joe McElwain. Didn't know him well. and We'd never been out together, anything like that, but we knew each other uh, from being around the streets in Butte. And uh, I said, I wish you'd take a uh, look at your ownership up there, Joe, and see uh, if there's some way we might uh, get you to sell the land to the federal government. And he said, all right, well, I'll call you back. We'll see what, what's going on. And uh, I don't know how long it was, but a month or two. And uh, Joe came back to me and said, yeah, I think we can, I think we can work something out there. He said, I, it's almost like everything else you've been doing back there, Williams. I'm not sure I agree with you a goddamn bit. But it, nonetheless, he said, uh, you have been kind enough to call and give us a chance to see if we can get out of that area uh, to our own benefit. And uh, so I've talked to the board, and I've talked to some of our lawyers and land people. And, uh, yeah, they think there may be a way out. Uh, we did a trade with Joe and the Montana Power Company, dollar for dollar. 
Uh, and we traded Joe into lands in eastern Montana, lands that contained coal. <laughs> Joe wanted coal. Of course he wanted coal. He's generating power. And uh, it was a dollar-for-dollar dollar trade. We had to do a lot of appraising to be sure that the taxpayer wasn't getting skinned here. Uh, Joe was an honest, truthful kind of guy. But he could skin you faster than you could breathe. And so we wanted to be sure that <laughs> yeah, taxpayers were being protected. Um, so Joe called me up and said, all right, we've got the land. We're sending a guy back there to talk to you. And we've also got a lawyer in Washington. He'll come in and talk to you. And, and uh, you may want to have some lawyers from around there, Pat. I know you're not a lawyer, so you may want to have some lawyers come and land lawyers. And I said, oh, we'll, we'll have the right people at the meeting, Joe. And he said, okay, well, just know that we're trying to get a good deal going. All right. And uh, so the meeting took place, and um, and they did okay. And they didn't skin anybody. Taxpayers came out good. Uh, we did a dollar-for-dollar, dollar, you know, land trade. Uh, and they, they got some land out in eastern Montana in the coal country. And the rattlesnake then, therefore, then got consolidated as a block of federal land. So now we're at the place where we can really start talking about which acres we're going to designate. And uh, I had an idea for close to 90,000 acres. And uh, the 90,000 came, you know, both sides of the road. And right down to where the homes are, up in the northern Rattlesnake neighborhoods, came right down to the homes. And Senator Melcher, who was not a big fan of wilderness, although he did see the, over, the designation of a lot of acres of wilderness in America as, as a senator, U.S. senator. But he was, John was not, uh, what you'd think of generally as a first-class environmentalist. It's not where his head was. And uh, so he was very resistant to bringing the rattlesnake area down to people's fence lines. And as I look back on it now for many years, I think John was right. People would have violated the wilderness without knowing they were violating it. Backing their car out of their driveway. Uh, you know, the rear bumper would go into what turns out to be a wilderness area. You don't want to do that. So um, John insisted that the bottom area be excluded, the area you now go up in and you know you're in the rattlesnake, if not wilderness, at least the rattlesnake recreation area. He wanted to exclude all that from designation and just do the upper high country as wilderness. Uh, 50,000 acres, maybe. And uh, I said no. That was John and my first legislative disagreement while I was in the Congress. And uh, it's, uh, it's very uncomfortable when you're disagreeing with a really good friend. John and I served in the Montana legislature together, the state legislature. And uh, he and his wife and kids, one of whom lives here, uh, up in the Rattlesnake, uh, we're good friends, so it was a very difficult time. But uh, beside the point, uh, John finally agreed that we could designate the lower area, the area you walk up into now. We could designate that, and I came up with this title, National Recreation Area. My recollection is nobody knew what the hell a National Recreation Area was, including me. But it was a name, and then we put we put some legal language around it, uh, and J John agreed. So we ended up with area on top, the high country, protected by full blown wilderness, and then the lower area protected. Some things you can't do in there, 
but a national recreation area that had uh, and and remains having very high use. I think Steve said maybe up to 90% of the people that go into the rattlesnake go into the lower area. And I guess they, especially people that come in from out of state to visit you, they go for a little walk and that, and it's peaceful as hell in there, right? Go for a little walk in that lower area and they go tell their friends about their trip to Montana. I walked in a wilderness area. Yeah. Well, not quite, but what the hell close enough. Uh, I know we want to leave some time for questions, but uh, before we do that, I, I, I'd like to maybe talk about then versus now in Congress, in politics. Uh, you know, we didn't know it at the time, but uh, the passage of the Rattlesnake Wilderness was almost the cresting of the wave. You passed that bill in 1980. Three years later, a much harder fight, we, uh, the Montana um, delegation got the Lee Metcalf Wilderness uh, designated over by Bozeman. And then they rolled up their sleeves and went to work to try and come up with a statewide wilderness bill. They're going to solve this once and for all, designate a bunch. You guys worked hard on that and long. A lot of Montanans did. Uh, that ended up being vetoed by President Reagan. Um, and I, you mentioned uh, the consideration you got as a freshman Democrat getting a bill through uh, for partisan benefit. I thought, uh, I think uh, later, uh, Ronald Reagan did a pocket veto on the statewide wilderness bill to benefit a candidate running against John Melcher, uh, Conrad Burns. Whether that helped him get elected or not, I don't know, but he did. So, and since then, we have had no more wilderness bills. We did have a bill a few years ago that adjusted some boundaries along the Rocky Mountain front. Uh, but really, it's been, uh, it's been a, 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 a fruitless endeavor to, to pursue wilderness. I'd like your thoughts on why, why things more or less ground to a halt. People kept the, up the advocacy. Uh, my perception is support for wilderness continued to grow in Montana, but it just didn't seem to get any traction. Um, what changed from the time you started off in Congress to as you, through your 18 years there and what you see going on now? Um, Colorado, Missouri, Louisiana, South Dakota, South Carolina, and New Mexico had within my first couple of terms in the Congress passed statewide wilderness bills. Now, obviously, the whole state wasn't included in the wilderness bill, but they finished their inventory. They looked and said, what can be wilderness? They went to the Congress. They said, here we go. Went through subcommittee, full committee, did the whole thing. Went to the Senate, same process. Got the president to sign it. All those states. And uh, I thought, my goodness. We passed the original wilderness bill. That is the, f the mother wilderness bill, which created a definition of wilderness in America. What is wilderness? That was done long before I got to Congress. It was done in 1964. And every act since then has complied with that bill and simply attached another little piece of valuable land to that designation, wilderness. 1964. A Montanan... In 1964, a United States senator who had had several terms in the House named Lee Metcalf. And some of you are shaking your heads, of course. Lee Metcalf was one of the movers and shakers, as the term is, of that 1964 Wilderness Act. And I thought, 
my goodness, all these states that I've read off to you are passing their wilderness bills through the Congress, several of them through the Interior Committee, of which I was a member. And I watched that process and was part of it and tried to help them. And uh, all that's going on, and I'm thinking to myself, God, whatever happened to Metcalfs? I know Lee isn't here anymore, I'm sorry to say, but whatever happened to that Montana where we would be right smack in the middle of it, like he was in creating the original Wilderness Intent Act in 1974, 64. I thought, well, why am I asking this question? I am here. I'm, I'm in the seat Lee Metcalf used to have in the house, let's do something. So I thought, well, it wasn't many weeks ago I sat in Arnie Bogey's living room with Henry Bugby and the others, and they were talking to me about, let's do something about wilderness and the rattlesnake. Why don't you start there, Pat, and let's catch up. So I went to the chairman, Mo Udall, and said, Mo, I think I'm going to introduce a wilderness bill the rattlesnake and told them what it was and what its values were and what its difficulties might be because it had been beat up a little. And Mo was very appreciative of the fact that I was going to try to get Montana back in the wilderness mix. And uh, so away we went. Is that the question you asked? Be more specific. Well, I guess uh, because we do want to cut for questions, maybe uh, I'll just offer an observation. You know, there was a lot of concern about logging back in the 70s, a lot of concern about motorized vehicles in the back country. Uh, what happened shortly after the passage of the Rattlesnake and Wilderness Bill is the pressure, Ronald Reagan became President of the United States, and it was tremendous new pressure to increase logging from the national forests. Also, we saw the advent of, of not uh, simple low-power motorcycles, but all-terrain vehicles, first three-wheelers, then four-wheelers, and that took off, and the, uh, the amount of use in the backcountry uh, for off-road uh, off vehicles increased substantially. And I just would fast forward to today, uh, in, recent, in the recent past decade, uh, um, uh, uh, Senator John Tester had a bill to try and create, uh, designate some new wilderness areas and also do some logging um, work. And the opposition wasn't from the timber industry or miners. It was from the, the off-road vehicle people. And that's become such a substantial constituency that uh, Congress defers in many cases to it, especially with the current makeup of Congress. So I wonder... I wonder, you know, shortly after you passed the wilderness, uh, the, the rattlesnake wilderness, you found that the Lee Metcalf wilderness was a harder, a harder push. And then after that, nothing. You just couldn't get a bill passed. And there were many attempts to do that. And, uh, and I just wonder, given some of the, the, what was going on in the background, had you not been able to get that pill, bill passed in 1980 or thereabouts, would it ever have gotten done? And if it hadn't gotten done by the early 80s, would we have a rattlesnake wilderness and national recreation area? And would this town be the same? Well, um, you know, that was an era, at least in the Congress, when the job was to attempt to complete the passage of the wilderness inventory, I'll call it. A lot of lands out there of special qualities, Congress was saying to itself, after hearing from people like you, a lot of lands out there. We have inventoried them, the Forest Service has. We know what their qualities are. Now we ought to start deciding which are going to go into the wilderness bank, out of the inventory into the bank, and which uh, are going to have other kind of protection, if any. 
And uh, the Congress kind of satisfied itself that it had completed that process and done a reasonably good job of it. At about the time I was trying to pass a final Montana wilderness bill in the late 80s and early 90s, late 80s primarily. I had a bill that was numbered uh, 20, 2090, I think, HR, House Resolution 2090. And we got it through the, uh, it was a, a bill to finish Montana's inventory, put it in the bank. And it was a bill of millions of makers. And uh, uh, some of my friends out here were absolutely appalled, including a lot of friends at Butte. God love them. They were just appalled. Pat, we can get jobs out of this. Uh, I'd say to them, look, those days are gone. These companies are about to skip town. Why? There's no money left in these trees. We aren't going to fill up these lumber yards anymore. Those days are simply gone. Those jobs are going to be kaput. But we can attract people to come out here and recreate in these areas, either motorized or otherwise. otherwise. But to do that, We've got to we've got to put boundaries around nothing else, just map boundaries around these shining mountains of ours, and present them to the nation as the last best place. Jobs will come back. There'll be different kind of jobs. We won't be cutting trees anymore. Not because we decided not to, but because there's no money in the trees left. We've pretty much mined the place. We know where the gold and silver was. We've pretty much done our thing here. Now we have a whole new, uh, what, industry, job market, we call it the last best place. It turns out that the last year, Montana generated $6 billion from tourists. $6 billion. Last best place. Um, we made a pay. Well, as I see people in my fishing hole, my hunting spots, I wonder if we haven't overshot the mark. Um, well, let's, um, well, let's, uh, could, could we open it up for some questions? I think we'd like to have some questions. Sure, yeah, we can definitely open up for questions. We've got about 15 minutes. I do want to take a moment to thank MCAT. They provided a, a grant for us to uh, record this, um, and this will be available um, in the future. So yeah, if anyone has questions, we'll pass the mic around just so that the, the recording can pick that up. Sure. Pat, thanks for coming today. It's good to hear you and your thoughts again. My question actually is comes right off your last statement about the $6 billion generated here in Montana as a result of uh, the marketing of the last best place, which we also remember the gentleman who owns Paws Up, up to Blackfoot, tried to patent that term. And I think Senator Bacchus helped us out there. But anyway, um, and I'll admit I'm very biased. I've had the privilege of living here about 45 years. And like everyone has seen changes, and we see changes no matter where we live in the country. But outside of the businesses on Higgins Avenue, for instance, in Missoula and the transportation industry that's transporting people here. Um, what are your thoughts on what we saw in the mid 90s? And I remember on the city council having discussions in the early 90s about, gee, um, 
do we want to become a Jackson Hole? Do we want to become a Boulder? And infill started and, and the discussions on that and protecting land outside Missoula. So long story short, <clears throat> we see we see folks in Missoula that can't afford to live here anymore. We see labor shortages in all businesses, and there's a lot of reasons for that, I know. But part of it is that some of the people that staff those businesses can't afford to live in Missoula. So you know where I'm going with this. What are, you, what are your thoughts? There are some things, including that process I just went through, skimmed through, about how a bill becomes a law. Uh, there are some parts of these dilemmas that uh, we, we can't recognize. There are some results that we can't predict. And it does seem to me that while, and as a former elected official, you know, uh, while we can't give up on a lot of this, we also have to understand that we don't know everything there is to know to stop some of these inevitably bad things from happening. We're just not sure how to come to grips with some of these problems. Uh, you know, the fact that we've protected our land in pretty significant measure was not a mistake. The fact that uh, people would have come here in some force or manner or other uh, in increasing numbers every year, whether a wilderness bill had passed or not, uh, America would have come to see these wonderlands. And uh, I mean, Yellowstone and Glacier Park would still be here and they're, they went through many of these same kind of battles I'm talking about to be created. Um, so we're gonna have people come here regardless. And not only do we not know how to prevent them from coming, but we should not, in my opinion, prevent them from coming. Uh, on some of our, uh, we're, we're going to make some attempts, most of which will be pretty feeble, but people in Montana who have some authority over these things will make some attempts to do things like limit the traffic in Glacier. Not only slow, but actually limit and prevent uh, the crowding of going to the Sun Highway. And we're going to see those kind of tensions down the road here, no pun intended, down the road uh, as, we, as, as we try to figure out how do we uh, keep Montana clean and fresh, uh, unhurried. How do we achieve that? It's not an easy trick. Uh, but it seems to me that we're going to need more local people to recognize the problem and get involved in the solutions than we're seeing now in Montana. I don't think we have an, enough local solutions or enough people that have the kind of concerns that you have about tomorrow's Montana. Uh, we all need to keep our eyes open about that because... Uh, who was it? Bob Dylan had the song, uh, The Times They Are Changing? No kidding. And we got to figure out how to be ready for it. Uh, Steve, you have any thoughts on it? Just a quick one. We've had waves of this, basically, this issue. How, uh, one thing, I don't know the answer. I just know that the answer is not to... Uh, stop making this such an attractive place that we shouldn't we should make this less desirable so fewer people want to move here maybe we'll even move away so uh, you know a, a lot of people 
worked hard uh, in uh, myriad ways to create the Montana we know and love. And uh, I guess I'd just say we have uh, some duty to do the same, to keep working on these things, to tackle these problems, to try and find the right balance points. Uh, it's just an, uh, just an ongoing challenge. It's different than designating the rattlesnake wilderness, but it's, it's, it's the same kind of thing. We have to figure out what it is we want and then how to get there. Okay, we got time for one or two more questions. Anyone else? Yeah. yeah, I have a question about a remark you made earlier about the rattlesnake recreation area. And you left me with the impression that you invented the concept of a recreation area, a national recreation area. Is that more or less correct? And if not, what is the story? I do know the national recreation areas go back for decades. I think Lake Mead was the first one designated. I don't know exactly when that was, but uh, uh, I think um, perhaps you were speaking of in Montana, but uh, uh, we haven't had, up to then, we didn't have very many of them. Well, they certainly don't take the place of wilderness, nor are they intended to. Uh, I guess in the back of my mind somewhere during those hectic flush days uh, was the word were the three words national recreation area because I was in a frankly a pitched fight with our senior senator John Melcher dear personal friend for years and year decades before that before we served together in the in the Congress but I was in this pitch battle with him because he didn't want to bring the wilderness down to fence lines. I didn't get that. So finally, it was clear the bill was not going to get through the Senate. The rattlesnake bill wasn't going through the Senate without John Melcher's support over and out. So I thought, okay, let's name it something else on the bottom. Let's not bring it all the way down to the fence lines, but not, let's not call it wilderness. Let's not give it those values. And, or that kind of enforcement power and uh, bring it down 20,000 acres or so and uh, out pop the words, which I didn't remember other places having, uh, National Recreation Area. So I penned it in the bill, 20,000 acres National Recreation Area. And, uh, you know, my damn fool suggestion became law. Actually, good suggestion. This wasn't original. Like most of my best ideas. Um, so uh, you actually inserted a word or two, a, a phrase into the bill that uh, talked about uh, uh, education, uh, having an education uh, function for, the, uh, for this area. Could you just quickly mention that? Yeah, thanks for... Thanks for mentioning that because I wanted to uh, I wanted to do a minute, which is uh, half of what we have left. Uh, I sent out a uh, a flyer that you used to get in the mail from your members of Congress and still do, although I don't see them very often anymore. But they were on issues of local importance, and this one says the rattlesnake. Missoula's Backyard Classroom. And it was right after it got passed, 1980. And I had asked a group of local people to just sit on a committee and see if they could come up with the idea of how best to utilize the educational capacity of the rattlesnake area as a laboratory, classroom, teaching place to bring students. And I thought about building a small, uh, having built a small uh, 
building for two or three staff, either just outside the National Recreation Area or within the boundaries of it. And uh, um, the committee kind of fell apart. That is the committee of local citizens here who were supposed to devise ways to utilize this. I mean, we have this extraordinary opportunity for an educational resource. I'm a teacher, so I keep falling back on, yeah, let's educate people with whatever it is. We have an extraordinary opportunity to do that. It's four miles out of town to the wilderness area, four miles. We can spit that far. Butte, we used to throw rocks that far. Uh, the Forest Service has a home here. Several other national uh, environmental groups, land stewards, have their offices here. The University of Montana has a forestry department here. It's only a few miles away to the laboratory, to the classroom. Let's utilize it. Let's create things that educators hadn't thought about before. So people can learn about nesting eagles, grizzlies, running water, <laughs> crisp air. Let's pull it together. Let's use this as a classroom. Uh, I'm going to ask you to hand out a formal pitch on this that I've been carrying around with me for uh, 25 years. Are you saying you're not yet giving up on this idea? I haven't given up. I mean, why give up on it? <laughs> so that's what it's about. We're handing out what it's about. I think I have enough copies. I think I printed out 50 copies for everybody. Um, 60,000 acres of soaring, sparkling, clean classroom as our backyard. We ought to utilize it. I, uh, I, I wonder if uh, uh, some of the challenge of, of creating a, uh, a formal education infrastructure or program up there might be that we all live so close to nature. We're so involved. We're outdoors so much that uh, it's easy to take that for granted. And um, uh, so, yeah. Um, Hi, my name's Whitney Williams. I'm the youngest of Pat and Carol. And I just want to say, I remember being like 10, nine, when this was happening. And I just want to say it wasn't easy. He's making it sound a little bit like some people got in a room, men and women, by the way. Uh, Tracy Stone Manning came a little bit later, but the extraordinary people and all of you who fought for this. But I remember being a little kid in those days of the culture and the shift of red bumper stickers that said, no wolves, no wilderness, no Williams. <laughs> and they were all over Montana. And that, that was the early 80s too, and it wouldn't have happened without you all, without relatives, without friends, without the Missoulians who came, you know, before all of us. I mean, it just was back-breaking hard work. So I know we only had an hour and a half to talk about it, but I just want to say, Dad used to say there's a genius on every corner because all these ideas came from rooms like this and came from main streets all over Montana, and it's true, and it also would not have happened without this guy. Thanks, Whit. I, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't speak like this much in front of groups, but I always make sure she comes along. <laughs> she actually hasn't been with me for years. It's marvelous that you're here. All right. Well, thanks everyone so much for coming. I think Pat and Steve are available for some questions if you guys want to linger a little bit. But other than that, thank you so much. <laughs>